develop and use radio science instrumentation, and he leads uh, many technical efforts in software radio instrumentation, cutting across geospace, astronomy, and space science. Uh, these instruments are used to make detailed physical measurements and have been parts of many NSF, NASA, and DOD supported investigations. Um, key instrumentation includes the National Science Foundation, Milestone Hill, Geospace, Radar Facility, the new Rapid um, System, low-cost array radars, software-defined radio architectures for radio telescopes, and efforts to develop an, uh, an electromagnetic vector sensor for the upcoming NASA Aero Aurora Missions Radio Observer CubeSat mission. Oh, CubeSat, <coughs> very exciting. And uh, Dr. Lin studied at the University of Washington, um, UW, right? Yeah, right. Seattle. Seattle, um, where he received a Bachelor's of Science degree in Physics and a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science in 94. Uh, he joined UW Geophysics Program and pursued uh, studies uh, to the Doctor of Philosophy in Geoscience in 1999. His work has focused on passive radar observation and aurora borealis, and he's the prior chair of the USNC, URC Commission G, um, uh, and a member of the American Geophysics Union and a member of IEEE. Very important, very well, important. Well, thank you. I love that. So let's I wrote a long intro. <laughs> Dr. Lin. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. So um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. This is a little different audience than I'm normally talking to. Uh, I'm often talking to scientists about their instruments and about how we're going to make things happen. I've lived on the boundary of science, engineering, software, and radio for several decades now. And uh, we've gotten at MIT Haystack Observatory to implement a lot of interesting projects. MIT Haystack Observatory is a laboratory of MIT. Uh, we're out in Westford, Massachusetts, about 40 minutes from here. Uh, used to be in the middle of the countryside, and now civilization is gradually encroaching on us. Um, and uh, at the observatory, we, we have academic activities, MIT campus activities, as well as activities of MIT Lincoln Laboratory, which is MIT's defense lab. And so we, we span kind of a range of activities between those. I work for the academic side, primarily on the scientific systems. But we do collaborate with uh, both MI other parts of MIT as well as local universities in the New England area and elsewhere around the world. So I've worked with a lot of different systems and software radios over the years. And I'm going to highlight for you the science, why we want to do this, why we want to use software radios, how things have evolved over the decades, uh, and give you some perspective uh, things have gotten amazingly easy compared to the old days of doing this. You really had to work hard for a long time to get radio signals that were of scientifically useful uh, quality. Uh, we have some differences from the communications community. Uh, you have a lot of latency requirements that are very short. Oh, we've got to process something and get the packet and make the audio or get the data to a system and do it and turn it around and get it back very, very quickly. Um, my latencies can be decades. They can be longer than that. Uh, we take raw voltages with some of our systems and keep them. Uh, I've got data systems. We've been taking raw voltages of RF and keeping them since 2001. Uh, and uh, you know, at the time, it was a lot of data storage. And now it's still a lot of data storage because the bandwidths went up. Um, radio in the space environment. We know a lot about the space environment because of radio. Uh, there are natural emissions. There's thermal emissions from black body radiation. There's what astronomers like to call continuum, emi continuum emissions which are generated by processes that are non-thermal. That's um, typically something like synchrotron radiation, where you have an electron going around a magnetic field, say, in the galaxy. And as it goes around that field, it feels acceleration, and it radiates light when it does that. And it turns out you can go, and with a sufficiently sensitive system, you can detect that, that energy. You can also map it spatially. You can look at it as a function of frequency. Um, there are some things that are very strong emitters of radio energy. The galaxy is actually very strong, especially at low frequencies. It's the source of a lot of the noise to the communications radios in our environment. Uh, it is, of course, structured very interestingly in time, space, and uh, we, we like to study that. Uh, a lot of the systems we develop at MIT Haystack Observatory are interested at looking at or below the thermal noise level. So we're interested in incredibly weak signals and often we're operating in environments that require very, very high dynamic ranges, such as the New England area over the last decade or so. Um, so if you look at the galaxy in visible light, this is what it looks like. And uh, you know, you're looking at it edge on, because we're in one of the spiral arms. And if you ever see the galaxy from the top, it's imaginary. They, they made the picture up, pretty much. They're starting to map everything in 3D. So eventually, we'll be able to make a 3D representation of the galaxy. 
If you look at the galaxy in radio, you actually see very different structures. You see things like this prominence that comes up. Uh, that's tracing out magnetic field structure of the galaxy in plasma that's moving in those magnetic fields and radiating. This happens to be at 408 megahertz, which is uh, in the UHF band. There are often bright sources. There's uh, Cas A, for example, Cygnus. There's Sagittarius A. This is a particularly interesting one because it's an emission that is from matter falling into a black hole at the center of our galaxy. So the matter falls in, it disappears, but on its way to falling in, it's really accelerated a lot, and it emits very, very brightly. And you can study that. And one of the projects at Haystack that I won't talk about in detail is actually to take a global network of telescopes at millimeter wave and make images of the black hole at the center of the galaxy to test general relativity. Um, there are other strong, other types of emissions. Uh, one type of uh, emission is molecular lines. MIT Haystack Observatory has a 37 meter a radio telescope and radar that over the years has been used to map out a lot of chemistry in the universe around us. You can ask, you know, where is water in the universe? Where is it in, in, in our galaxy? Um, and so these molecular line transitions can be very powerful tools for probing the fundamental physics of star forming regions, for understanding in our own atmosphere, say, where particular species are emitting or absorbing light um, that allow us to make physical measurements, say, of temperature or pressure or the motion of material around a star. You can measure the Doppler shifts of particular spectral lines uh, as, as material is moved. Um, material is also redshifted, uh, and light is redshifted as, it, uh, as the space around us expands in what's called Hubble expansion. And so you can look for, say, a signature of hydrogen, and you can look for it at a lower frequency where it has been shifted to by Einstein's prediction and you know, the reality that space is physically expanding and the energy of light is becoming more dilute uh, with, with, uh, with propagation through space. Now, there are also strong radio emitters, uh, say, in our solar system. Some of these, uh, our sun is a very active variable star. It's an extremely dynamic object, um, and so far it's been moderately benign to, uh, to us, which is good. It allows us to have civilization and computers and GPS satellites, and if you had a really active star like some of the ones we see elsewhere in the galaxy, we might not be in an environment that was particularly favorable for technological development. All right? Um, you have, coming off the sun, you have solar wind that blows out into the solar system between the planets. And it goes between 250 and 800 kilometers a second, depending on what's going on. And uh, sometimes the sun puts off solar flares and blasts of material into the solar system called coronal mass ejections. And these coronal mass ejections propagate out from the sun somewhere between 400 kilometers a second and, and uh, 3,200 kilometers a second is, I believe, the fastest one that's been seen. And they go out and propagate through the solar system. And we see the light from the solar flare and x-rays in eight minutes from the sun. That's the propagation time from the sun to the Earth. However, the, the coronal mass ejection can take a day or several days sometimes to get here uh, to cross the space between the planets. And as it interacts with each planet in turn, it modifies the, the atmosphere and the near space environment around that planet. And some planets, of course, like the Earth, have a magnetic field. And when a planet has a magnetic field, you can get very dynamic interactions between the material blowing off the sun, the solar wind, and the magnetic field of the planet. So they probably taught you in school that the Earth has a dipole magnetic field. It's got a north pole and a south pole and nice smooth field lines. And it's this beautiful, pretty picture that has nothing to do with how the Earth's field really looks, except at kind of first order, OK? The, the Earth's magnetic field gets pulled out just like as if you had a boat moving through an, a, a, a body of water at speed. There's a bow shock in front of the boat, and then there's a wake that's pulled out behind the boat. Well, the magnetic field of the Earth gets stretched out by this solar wind. And that creates local dynamics around a planet in what's called the planetary magnetosphere. So you get a long tail that's pulled out. You get compression on the bow side. And what, what happens when you distort a magnetic field is you have to have a current associated with that. That current has to flow in a loop. All right. So that current closure in the magnetic field of the Earth actually happens through the Earth's poles. And it's associated with the phenomenon we call the aurora. So if you've ever gone and been lucky enough to go see the aurora borealis in your life, or the, or the southern aurora, the aurora australis, then you have actually seen the current closure into the Earth's atmosphere of energetic particles flowing in the space environment of the Earth. 
Okay? And this is one of the things we study, and locally to the Earth, we often study this with either passive radio techniques to look at the radio emissions associated with this, or with active radio techniques such as radar systems that allow us to directly probe the physical state and conditions associated with the space environment. And so this is not to scale. In fact, you know, on the distance from the Earth, we're a little dot. We're just this incredible blue speck out in a vast, a vast solar system and an even more vast cosmos. Now, other planets, of course, have magnetic fields. And this is emission in radio up at 1.4 gigahertz from Jupiter, measured with a telescope called the Very Large Array in New Mexico. And you can make a nice, pretty picture of the emission. Uh, you can actually look for emissions from planets that are driven by these coronal mass ejections and these dynamic interactions of this material from the sun flowing through the space environment and distorting these magnetic fields. And Jupiter puts out a lot of emissions in about the 20 megahertz range. And I, this is actually an experiment I'm just trying to do now with instruments. And trying to do it around here is really hard. But if you go someplace a little farther away from civilization, you can actually pick up these radio signals from Jupiter, even with relatively small software radios and relatively inexpensive antennas. So there's a project called Radio Jove you can look up online that has a lot of information about how to do this kind of thing. And it's really hard to do if you live near a switching power supply with big radars and you know just places like, you know, I, I, have, the, I have these systems that consume a lot of uh, energy at Haystack. And they even though we try to keep them quiet, they put out noise and, and things we don't want to see. So that's the space environment. And it goes all the way from you know, the astronomical environment to the solar system, to the local ionosphere and near space environment of the Earth. The ionosphere is you know, the ionized portion of the Earth's upper atmosphere between 90 and, 100, and uh, about 1,000 kilometers in altitude. And there's a, you know, it extends out to several Earth radii, out to about 10 Earth radii, really, when you consider a planetary magnetosphere. And so this environment is incredibly rich in radio emissions, in physical processes that can be probed with radio propagation, in things that we can measure with radar. Uh, and so you know, we, we build instruments to do this. And we cover, at MIT Haystack Observatory, we really cover kind of from the low frequency range LF all the way through now up at a couple hundred gigahertz. All right, So we cover the whole breadth, depending on the instruments and the systems we build. Radio astronomy is one of the primary motivations. It's a very interesting field, obviously. Everybody gets really excited. All the students who apply to our summer programs want to be astrophysicists. OK, that's the, if you're an undergraduate by any chance in the room, don't, do, don't ask for one of the astrophysics projects if you want to be assigned to our, our, our summer program. You have a much better chance asking for one of my projects. Um, which, <laughs> OK, I do less exciting stuff sometimes from the, from the black hole point of view. Right? Everyone wants to look at black holes. But on the other stand, we do really stuff that's really neat. And you can actually like, go out in your backyard often and do it. Um, radio astronomy you know, goes all back. You know, they've got a certain aspect of it that is trying to explain the evolution and origin of the universe. And there's a lot of things we can talk about in that. There's galactic evolution. There's large scale structures. You know, Where are the galaxies? How are they clumped? How do they move? How do galaxies form? Where are the stars? Uh, how did stars form? Where did the first stars turn on? You know, what happened to cause that? And you know, we know from the Hubble expansion measurements and the, that the things that appear through independent metrics to be farther away in the universe appear to be redshifted to us. So the radio emissions often we're looking for, or the optical emissions we're looking for. We know the physics. You know, We think the physics of hydrogen has been the same through all this time. We know the radio emissions associated with the thermal emission of, of the first transition state of hydrogen. It's at 1.425 gigahertz. You can go look for it. And then you can go look for it, and you say, hey, wait a second. That object's further away, and it's at a lower frequency. All right. And when you do this and trace this all the way back, one of my colleagues, Alan Rogers, who's been at MIT Haystack for, I think, 50 years now, or 45 years, um, he just completed something that was in nature. It's, it's an absolutely revolutionary measurement. He did it with a radio telescope about the size of four, maybe five of these tables stacked together out in Western Australia, where there are 10 to the minus 3 humans per square kilometer. Okay? You got go so, to go, and you got to be 1,000 kilometers away from the nearest FM radio station. It's a very challenging measurement. But he, he measured down at, it turns out, about 78 megahertz. It's hard to see there. A signature of absorption of the, turn, of the ignition of the first stars in the early universe. This is a absor absor absorption feature from hydrogen redshifted all the way down to 180 million years after the presumed start of the universe. All right? 
And he managed to make this measurement. It's a few millikelvin out of 10,000 Kelvin. And so that you're making a thermal measurement of the absolute level of the radio signals to you know, millionths of a por you know, portion of the background radio environment. All right? It's a very challenging measurement to make. They've, of course, you know, they're trying to now have other people independently verify it and validate it. Because we, we you know, not only want to calibrate instruments well, and he's the king of, radar, of radio instrument calibration, but Alan is. But uh, we want to make those measurements that we know they're statistically robust. We know that the physics we're doing, if, you, if someone else goes and makes the measurement, we get the same result. Right? So it's a basic scientific process we're pursuing. Um, Radio telescopes use software radios behind them. In fact, I would, I actually think the radio astronomers were really the first users and inventors of software radio. Uh, they were doing a lot of the things that look like modern software radios in 1957 to 1963 or so. All right, the very early eras. Now, a lot of the computers were bigger. They were about the size of this room. <laughs> All right, and and they they didn't really have as much computing power as your phone, even not even close. It's not even the right orders of, orders of magnitude. But nevertheless, I, they were doing things with atomic clocks to synchronize voltages between multiple locations. They do that with big radio telescopes. It's called very long baseline interferometry, and MIT Haystack was one of the places that technique was developed uh, early on. Uh, we do a lot of stuff with single dish systems. Uh, to give you an idea of current systems, uh, we also use a lot of little radio arrays of smaller antennas where we take a bunch of antennas and gang them up. Our, our current radio telescopes, single dish systems, are operating between about 10 and 56 gigabits per second per channel. There's usually at least two polarizations at several frequencies. So there might be six channels like this. Um, so you know, useful scientific bandwidths really start in the 100 gigabit per second level right now. All right, so this is sustained raw voltage recording. Usually the dynamic range for the radio telescopes at higher frequencies is only a few bits. It might be four bits IQ, it might be two bits. Uh, you can do stuff with one bit. So all of you, everybody who wants large dynamic range systems, you can actually make do with one bit. You don't need, you don't need all these fancy A to D converters and everything that have 15 bits and 16 bits. Um, on the other hand, they're real fun. They make things easy. <laughs> um, VLBI systems do a similar thing. Our, our uh, Event Horizon Telescope project I mentioned uses very long baseline interferometry. And we're instrumenting of order 20, it depends on the experiment, of 10 to 20 telescopes around the world. And these systems, the current generation of hardware is now starting to do sustained data recording of 32 gigabits a second. And they'll go out and do a campaign that usually lasts about a week. So there's like seven days of 24 hours a day of recording times tens of systems times 32 gigabits a second, all right? And that data then gets transported by 747 or you know, commercial airliner. It's, it's sneakery net. So it turns out that despite all our wonderful wireless bandwidth and Shannon compression and everything we can do to try to, to get near the Shannon limit of data transfer, the fastest way to move data is, is by taking a physical object and moving it in general if you have enough data, all right? Um, Radio arrays, the current radio arrays, there's a whole generation, I'll show some pictures later of them, um, where we're having usually of order a thousand antennas in one location, uh, maybe several thousand antennas, dual polarizations. We're typically using in the older generation of systems that's currently operating about 100 uh, to 200 digital receiver channels on a system. And then those are being digitized usually about 30 megahertz of RF bandwidth at the end. All right, and that gets processed and beam formed often in real time. The systems all have kind of raw data capture capabilities for that. And those are used to use array techniques, you know, basically phased arrays or time delay arrays, depending on how you design it, uh, in order to look at the radio astronomical sky. If you take one of those telescopes and do that, you can make this type of image. This is an image at 150 megahertz from a telescope called the MWA in Western Australia. MIT Haystack Observatory developed a lot of the hardware and instruments and systems to make this telescope possible. And um, we, uh, we actually, this is an image of the galaxy that I showed you earlier, but now at a different wavelength. All right, so this is at 150 megahertz, and there's, there's the black hole at the center of the galaxy again. So, and that's made with a whole bunch of little antennas that are about, about this big, okay? They're not that, they're little bat wing dipoles. They're very simple. We always end up with these days with very simple antennas because we want to be able to model them very, very accurately, all right? 
Uh, and, and that can get to extremes. You know, you model the coax into the antenna, you remove the residuals, you make sure that the thermal characteristics are known. Uh, it depends on the level of calibration and validation that's needed for the particular measurement. Some things are very high signal to noise ratio, they're easy. Some things are very low, they're very difficult. Uh, upper atmosphere and geospace science is another major uh, area of the observatory. We use radar to do this largely. Uh, we also use radio propagation through the space environment. I, I cut my teeth, I guess, on this. I've moved on to being more than just geospace radar, but I, I, am, I am the guy who keeps a lot of geospace radar going at an MIT Haystack Observatory, along with a bunch of my team members who are in the back smiling at me because they've heard this stuff all before. Um, so I love radar, okay? And, and I love, I lo not only do I love making you know, radio astronomy measurements at the thermal noise floor, and, and big, strong, powerful radars are my nemesis, but I also love you know, building multi-megawatt radars and making a, a lot of emissions. Uh, the near space environment of the Earth is like incredibly complicated, okay? There's charged particles created in the Earth's upper atmosphere by ultraviolet from the sun, they create the Earth's ionosphere. They create the propagation environment for low freq frequency radio signals. So the fact that we can propagate a radio signal down at 10 megahertz across the ocean and bring the era of transatlantic communications into being, that's because there's an, this charged particle layer uh, in the space environment of the Earth. And that couples into that bigger picture of the Earth's magnetosphere and our presence in the solar system and the flow of charged particles and plasma pl past the Earth. Now, Underneath the charged atmosphere of the Earth is also the lower atmosphere. You know, we're, we're able to communicate by speaking to each other because sound waves propagate in it. Well, there's all kinds of phenomena, such as hurricanes and tsunamis and other things that happen on Earth that disturb the lower atmosphere. And those effects can actually propagate up to the upper atmosphere and be sensed by changes in the charged particles above us. So we can actually make measurements of the space environment to sense things that happen terrestrially whether it's a hurricane or lightning or uh, you know, discharges of, of various types of explosions. You can see all kinds of things. All right. So this environment has lots of dynamics. It's got lots of complexity. Occasionally, when the sun kicks off one of those coronal mass ejections, it absolutely blasts the space environment of the Earth. And you'll hear these days on the news, people say, you know, we're going to have a geomagnetic storm. And then, you know, if you go to the crank websites, they go, the Earth is going to end tomorrow. You know, that's the, and, you know, we're kind of looking at it going, where the hell did they get that? I don't understand that. You know, it, 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 it sometimes really dramatic things can happen. There was an event called the Carrington event in the last century, in the 19th century, actually that actually lit up the electrical telegraph lines with so much energy that they could run without batteries. And they could transmit their telegraph signals without batteries because there was so much energy dumped into the space environment that if it happened today, we might lose a lot of satellites, for example, which are in the energetic particle environment that exists around the Earth. So we like to study this. There's, it goes all the way from the fundamental plasma physics, the underlying what is moving there, how does it move, what are the energies, where is the momentum, what are the temperatures, what are the compositions, down to plasma waves and instabilities. Oh, look, things have gotten crazy. The sun blasted the Earth, and now you get things that manifest from a radio point of view as propagation changes, sporadic E, E skip. There's all kinds of things that the ham radio community has known about for years and years and years that we actually study using radar systems and try to make physical measurements and actually understand the physics of what goes on. And then you have things like you know, the more practical aspects, like you know, how is my HF radio going to propagate over the horizon and which frequency should I use? Or space weather. What are the dynamics? What are the structures that go over places? Do they create changes in the GPS signals, for example? You can have events which will cause metric size errors in your GPS signals. Okay? If you're walking around with your cell phone and your wife wants to know where you are, it doesn't matter, most likely. A meter or two here or there isn't a big deal. If you're landing a plane automatically or driving a car automatically, you may want a backup navigation approach that can cut in when that, that event occurs. And you may actually want to know that event is occurring. Um, to do studies of the near space environment, we operate geospace radars. Uh, the Millstone Hill geospace radar uh, has been operating uh, basically with an unbroken program since 1957. Uh, that's when this technique became possible. And basically, we have, we have systems that are measured in megawatt hectares, OK? So it's, it's an, acre, an acre of radar, and a million watts is the game that you need to play this, this game. And, and if you can lower your system temperatures on your LNAs, you can have a little smaller one. 
but not much smaller because it's a statistical process. And we send out radio signals into the space environment, and we scatter off the volume of free electrons in the plasma. Okay? Now, these have a, a small cross-section. All right? So you have to gather up, oh, about 10 to the 10th, 10 to the 11th electrons per cubic meter. And that gives you enough scatter that you can get the signals back. And so we'll send out, say, 2 million watts, 2.5 million watts with our radar at UHF. And if you, if you observe in the UHF band around here, sometime you look at our schedule, you'll be able to go, you'll be able to hear thump, 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 thump at 440 megahertz, because um, we, we tend to dominate that band, I guess is the right way of putting it. And um, that, those signals go out. And they scatter off that plasma in the space environment. And, and there are waves up there. So in the absence of waves, you might expect that the energy that would come back would reflect the thermal distribution of the plasma that was up there, of the ions and electrons. You would expect that you know, if it was hotter, you might have a broader thermal spectrum. If it was colder, it might be narrower. You might expect that the temperature would change as a function of altitude. You might expect that the amount of signal you got back was proportional to the amount of electrons that were scattering. It's a cross-section, right? Um, so it turns out that this works. And it became possible to do this in the mid-1950s. And there were some big systems built to do it. Uh, these systems were actually kind of secondary acquisitions from the Ballistic Missile Defense Early Warning System program with surplus antennas. Uh, and I think the expected lifetimes were a few years, but we're still using them uh, quite a while later. And uh, so we can actually do this measurement. And we set out 2.5 million watts, and we get 20 femtowatts back. Okay, And we integrate for a while. And I've done experiments from here to NREO Green Bank in West Virginia, where we showed we could do this by statically, and we, we only had to integrate for about an hour coherently in order to get the signals. And the data we're taking back is actually incoherent. So it's actually, it takes about, you have a number of samples, and they don't add up linearly. They add up as like the square root of the number of samples. So sometimes you have to add, do a lot, of, a lot of averaging. There's also, it's not just a thermal spectrum. There's waves in space, and there's lots of waves in space. There's different categories. There's things called ion acoustic waves, which rattle around up there. There's a thing called pl electron plasma wave, or a Langmuir wave that rattles around up there. They create Doppler shifted returns from the radio signals we transmit with the radars. And so you actually get a spectrum back that looks like this around the carrier frequency of the radar. This is frequency. This is amplitude here on the vertical scale. And what happens is you actually get this shape back. And, and this spectral shape is a Gaussian, a thermal distribution, mo modulated by a sine wave. And there's a sine wave going towards you and a sine wave going away from you. So it's a wave towards you and a wave away from you. And so you get these two peaks. And if you go down low in the atmosphere, they merge into one because there's a lot of collisions and things don't move around as much. And if you go up in the upper atmosphere, you actually can get little wings on this that come from different species like helium and hydrogen. Um, and then there's also this other wave that comes out that's usually uh, offset by uh, the frequency, what's called the plasma frequency of the, of the ionosphere, which is directly related to the electron density. Okay? And so you can actually measure this frequency that comes back and make a very precise measurement of the electron density. And if you do this as a function of range with a radar, you can make all kinds of detailed physical measurements. And it turns out one of the best physical theories we have in terms of predictive capability and our ability to test it is to predict the spectrum. So if you make measurements of the spectrum, we have a beautiful physical theory that we can do what's called inversion. We can say, we have data. We have theory. The theory has variables that control the theory, such as electron density, electron temperature, ion temperature. And now we want to know, for this data, what does the theory predict, say that, 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 evident, that those variables are? What are the physical measurements? And we want to put variances on that. We want to measure it with a variance. So we can do that. When we do that, if we scan our steerable antenna around, um, th this, is a this is a 46 meter steerable antenna. We have a 68 meter zenith antenna that points up. If you scan the radar around, you can make a cut through the near space environment of the Earth. Altitude range is between about 90 kilometers and 1,000 kilometers, typically. And the bright color there is more electrons, and the lighter colors are fewer electrons, OK, on a logarithmic scale. Uh, if you look up as a function of time versus altitude between 100 and about, a, about 900 kilometers there, uh, a lot of electrons, that's daytime uh, when the sun has lit up the ionosphere and ionized particles, and you can have nighttime. Uh, so we can see a lot of dynamics of the near space environment, and the Millstone Hill radar system can actually see from you know, roughly over Colorado down to over Florida, up to north, you know, in mid, uh, the, the uh, Maritimes in Canada and out into the middle of the Atlantic, and then the Earth 
is rotating. And it rotates under that magnetosphere, which is fixed in the frame of the solar wind. So we rotate through the physics that's going on in local time as we move uh, with the Earth. And so we can make all kinds of very interesting measurements. And there's, a, there's just an immense range of science from this. Um, an example, this, this is measure, these are measurements we made of the solar eclipse that recently happened, uh, which was visible here in New England. I hope you got to see it. It was interest, interesting. I think there's going to be another one in, what, 2024 or something like that. So if you missed your chance at a solar eclipse, for God's sake, don't look at it without, with your naked eye next time it happens, because you, know, you really actually can go blind. But you know, to take, make yourself a pinhole camera, get a nice filter, get some inexpensive glasses, uh, maybe from a reputable manufacturer. And, and then use those uh, with, you know, if you've got family and friends, to get excited about the space environment and watch one of these eclipses. It can be, if you're under totality, it's, a, it's a, you know, obviously an unforgettable experience. Now, if you've got a radar, you know, use it. If you've got a software radio, you could participate in using it. I know there was a lot of team of people that were looking at radio propagation. Even people who are not part of the normal space science community we're contributing as citizen scientists towards this measurement effort. And with, this, you know, with all these inexpensive software radios, we can do more. So, so I, I, see, I see a burgeoning era of citizen scientists, participants in interesting events like this where people can get excited about it. And it's also, of course, an opportunity for education. Now, if you scan our radar back and forth before totality, this is now a linear scale to enhance the differences. You actually see, OK, there's, you're cutting through the space environment. Of course, when we're doing this at an angle, closer in is lower altitude, farther away is higher altitude. All right? So you get this swath through there. When the eclipse comes through and you're in totality, you can watch the ionosphere go away. And if you look up as a function of time and altitude here with log electron density, you actually go along. This is a non-eclipse day. I think it's actually two days afterwards. And then you can actually look at this and you can see when the eclipse happened. Now we do this. We also map this kind of the, these kinds of effects with the radio propagation to GPS signals on the ground. You can make spatial maps. Uh, one of my colleagues published a beautiful paper on bow waves preceding the shadow of the eclipse through the space environment of the Earth. And so you actually have waves that are generated in the near space environment just because the moon's shadow is moving across the planet. So there's all kinds of really interesting physics to study. Now, software radio. We're at a software radio meeting, so I need to talk about software radio. And I, I have a love-hate relationship with software radio. None of the vendors here have really pissed me off lately, so you're all safe. Okay, the people who seem to who have made my life hell over the years are away and are not here anymore. Many of them are out of business or were consumed. It's probably not nothing to do with me, you know. Um, but uh, early software radios were adopted in the scientific community. As I said, I actually think the astronomers were the first ones to really do this. But uh, the DOD has the first mention of a digital receiver in 1970. Okay, that's just some per perspective, is you are part of something here that has marched along from being, you know, million dollar systems to $20 dongles, okay? And that $20 dongle doesn't perform a whole lot worse than the million dollar system did in 1970 or 1980. Um, military and government systems, a lot of the early scientific systems were, you know, grad students make hand making stuff making it work, but it looked fundamentally like signal processing applied to voltages of radio. Okay, so you've got an antenna, you've got some sort of amplifier, you've got a digitizer, all right? And, and at a pure concept, that is the pure concepts of software radio, is we've got some sort of interface to the electromagnetic environment, an antenna, and we have a match to it, we have some sort of gain to set the noise figure, and we digitize it, and then everything else is software after. Now, in practice, we've had to use, you know, to get our computation high enough, we need to use tools of computation. Okay, FPGAs, GPUs, CPUs, all right? It's just computing, all right? And it's computing on software, and some of that computing is harder to change than others. Some of it that's supposed to be really flexible and programmable still takes teams of people years to make it work, all right? And there's been a lot of smart people, of course, making chips and selling them and get, making this stuff easier and easier to do. Uh, this is Speakeasy. This was what was really the first Air Force communications idea of a software radio implemented with VME buses and Sun Microsystem computers. Um, and that was in the, in the 1990s, like 1992, 1991. Um, early on, you had software demodulation was what they were going after. They were going after the idea we can demodulate radio signals and software. The scientists were going, we can record data signals 
on tape recorders. <laughs> and we can take those tapes and bring them to a computer and do signal processing and analysis that reveals things about the natural environment based on the system we used or where we pointed our radio telescope or the set of radio telescopes we used. Um, Joseph Matola, Joe actually visited us uh, about a year ago now. And he, he is really responsible, I think, for the reinvention of software radio. And um, you know, I, there's a lot of people in these stories, and you, all, you never know them all, and you, never miss, you miss half of them, probably, because some of them couldn't talk to you. But uh, anyway, he's really responsible. I think he wrote a beautiful book, if you haven't read it as a student. It's very communications-focused, so you guys really like it. But he, he wrote this. And this was a very big influence on me as I went into working at Haystack with Software Radar. And you know, what I was given was, oh, here's our software radar, Frank. This is Midas 1. I, I walked in on this thing, and it was, it was I, I would describe it as a product of learning by the engineers who built it. I guess is that, that's the fair way of putting it. This was uh, what I think, I, I am, MIT Lincoln Laboratory probably had some software radios prior to this. This is one of the very early software radios. After digitization, everything was done in general purpose computing. It was a thing called the transputer. OK, you don't want to know about it, kids. Um, but nevertheless, <laughs> you know, there's all these racks in computing. And then you know, digital filtering, down conversion, processing, radar frame, you know, raster generation, correlation, signal processing, analysis was all done in this. And then it got dumped out to a slower you know, computer that, could, that couldn't handle those data rates. Uh, we came in and began to develop solutions to replace this. Uh, I had a colleague of mine, Tom Gridlin, I worked with uh, in 1999 and 2000. We started doing this. Um, there were other things going on in kind of this era. Uh, you started to get ASICs implementing the software radio concept in hardware. Um, some of the prominent ones were gray chip. I think analog devices had one. Harris had one. And these chips had digital down converters and digital up converters. It was really all about digital receivers, digital transceivers. And you know, for a long time, we were at, stuck at 105 million samples per second. That was the, that was the sampling rate they'd go to. And, and, and of course, that doesn't divide evenly into a lot of stuff. So you want to have, you want to have 100 mega samples. So you really did a lot of stuff at 100 mega samples. This is an example of a radio array that was built. It had um, about 1,000 antennas, each of which was digitized in dual polarization by gray chips into black fin DSPs from analog devices, and then offloaded into a computer by Alan Rogers, actually. And this thing, this thing, I think, is still one of the cost winners in per channel cost for a software radio array. Okay, and and the goal for this particular array was to measure the spectral signature of deuterium, which is an isotope of hydrogen, in the galaxy. So you can measure it moving towards you in the galaxy, moving away from you, and not moving in the middle. You can look off into deep space and not see it. And then, if you integrate for oh about two years, you can detect it at about seven sigma. OK? So you can make a long integration of raw voltages. And Alan had, was notorious for going to everywhere within 100 miles and tracking out down any radio emission in this band that he could possibly find and you know, offering to pe change people's sound cards out all right, so that they would do this. So we've had a long history in software radio. It's been very exciting. Modern software radios have come along. And they're largely FPGA based now. That makes them quite flexible. There's a lot of computing power in the FPGA. The FPGA is not magical. Okay, it's a computing device. All right, it happens to be a really good one. It's what we've got. If we could program them a thousand times easier, we would be a thousand times, maybe a million times happier. Um, you have the return of the tuner, I would call it. Okay, so selectivity as you drive costs down can be easier to achieve in analog than in digital. The the software radio software radar concept was really digitize it all, directly synthesize it all. Now we're starting to see that. We're starting to see the giga sample radio, radio show up. And they're just solving some of the problems that were formerly hard. Uh, but they still take quite a bit of power to do that. Uh, low cost software defined radios, RTL dongles. These, you can do some incredible things with little RTL dongles if you work hard enough. Uh, GNU Radio Framework has come along and, and brought uh, open source software radio to the masses and to the larger community. Um, we use it for some things. We don't use it for others. It depends on whether it's appropriate or not for what we're, what we're doing. Um, GNU Radio tends to change a lot, which can be very challenging for a system that you want to have operate correctly for 20 years. All right? Um, highly capable integrated radios. You're starting to get Xilinx RF system on a chip coming out uh, from a DARPA program. Uh, tuning ranges and bandwidths. We're starting to do some incredible things. OK, none of this is the important part. 
I know you love hardware. I, I build hardware. I love hardware. I'm a hardware wonk. I know about registers. I programmed great chips. I know about the 600 registers you got to make to make the damn FIR filters work properly. All right? Um, this, is, this is stuff is going to change. It's ephemeral. Three years from now, it's different. Five years from now, it's different. Ten years from now, we're going to look back and go, that stuff was really primitive. A hundred years from now, we might have our direct digitizers on a chip at the quantum level. All right? Underneath this is a deeper pattern. It's called a voltage level data pattern. This is something we recognized about two decades ago. And it's the idea that there is information structure associated with what we're doing. And it these patterns lead to recurrent problems that you can solve in particular ways. And those solutions have particular consequences that come out of it. So at the base, you have a sensor element you want to make a measurement from. There's some sort of analog connection to that, a transfer function associated with that. There is usually an A to D converter in there. You can ask, can I get rid of the A to D converter? There has been research into that. Uh, a lot of the compressive sensing work that was done was about getting rid of A to D converters. Uh, I need to move on fast here. Digital transfer functions, voltage level data, voltage sequences. Now, then you store it or do something with it. Okay? In science, we keep it. We keep it for a long time. There's metadata, data describing the data All right, throughout all of this. If you want a calibrated, validated system that you know what you did, 20 years ago, you need to know all this and keep it. And if you keep the voltages, you need to keep it with the voltages. All right. So we've spent a lot of time solving this in various systems and using this pattern to leverage and, and understand architecturally what we do uh, to make it possible. One of the early things we did was the software radar architecture. It has what we call a coherent interface layer. It broadcasts data on multicast on gigabit ethernet. It looks like a lot what GNU Radio does today, Okay, but it was much more focused on radar. All right. Uh, we published this back in about 2001 and have, to have an operational system that still operates to this day. Um, this coherent interface layer is very important. It's the clock boundary. The understanding of the phase alignment of the radio waves at the antennas precisely relative to global time or relative to the time of another sensor allows you to do things mathematically and in terms of extracting information that are otherwise impossible. All right. Um, this is Midas W software radar system. These are radar pulses. Uh, that's what the system looked like, I'd say, when it was the cleanest. Um, I went on to do some extra work on the side that was to develop passive radar networks using software-defined radios in, in, in what I call cubes. This network was put out, and it was to look at those turbulent processes in the near space environment that kind of blow you away. Um, when you do this, you end up with a software radio and a transport rack. And I am by no means the only person that put software radios in transport racks and shipped them around. I went to a meeting with the Air Force once, and I had guys from uh, SAIC show up, and I showed up, and we gave talks. I and I was after them, and we both put up boxes that looked the same. Okay, <laughs> you could you could almost not have told that we had you know we'd bought from the same vendors. It was really eerie. Um, and you can measure, you know, this is like radio beacons as a function of time and frequency at 150 and 400 mega, or uh, yeah, 100, 150 and 400 megahertz. Uh, this is scatter from plasma in the near space environment measured with passive radar. So this is uh, range here. This is Doppler shift, and the scatter occurs when you get those energetic space environment events. Um, this is a software radio system we did with some Edis radios. We took to Arecibo, and we measured. Uh, two channels at 30 megahertz of RF bandwidth, 16-bit IQ, for 36 hours continuously with the Arecibo radar. And this is the electron density measurement from Arecibo, which is a beautiful little line. This was done with a colleague of mine, Juha Virnan, I think has spoken to you before. And it, it's, it's like, it looks like a theoretical profile of the Earth's ionosphere, but it's a measurement. It's a beautiful instrument. Astronomers have invested heavily in putting radio arrays out with lots of little antennas. This is the MWI I mentioned earlier. This has one digital receiver for 16 antennas with an analog time delay beam former. Um, we're working on square kilometer array. I've been able to, through some of my projects, participate in this. Uh, and uh, this, is the, this is a prototype station in Western Australia for what's called the low frequency portion of the square kilometer array. And there we're headed towards gigasample per element digitization. All right. Uh, I'll say they're wanting to do 500,000 channels at a giga sample. All right, so not a small instrument. We've been working on cloud scale software radar. You take those voltages, you have some deep solid state ring buffer. If this buffer gets big enough compared to your RF bandwidths, you can keep the data for the life of the instrument. If we work with 100 hertz bandwidths and AM radio carriers and look at the waves in the ionosphere, with a terabyte, we can keep 10 years of data. 
Okay? With a three terabyte system, we could keep 30 years of data. That's the life of the hardware for it to rust out in the field. We are going to build radio arrays in the future that have thousands or millions of elements, and every element from the day you turn the system on to the day the system is shut down will keep the entire radio environment that was impingent on that. And you can search it and correlate it and image it and snapshot it, but you need scalable computing. And this is where it gets into software, is you can scale onto a gate array, you can scale into a cloud computer. Okay, I'll try to finish up here reasonably quickly. Uh, RAPID is my uh, project that was involved with the Square Kilometer Array using their antennas, uh, working with Cambridge University. Uh, this is actually our, our quad channel giga sample radio kicking out one channel uh, from an 80, 96, 80 with 250 megahertz of bandwidth with a sine wave. Uh, my engineer Reggie in the back just got that working the other day, so I was real happy to show it. We work with these antennas. They're, they look like log periodic antennas that measure dual polarization or droopy dipoles. And the idea with RAPID is, what if we put a data system in a base, hook it up to the antenna, and make it easily shippable, solar and battery powered, and we could take a small number of them anywhere in the world we want to do high signal to noise ratio science. If you go near a radar, you do it with radar. If you go near a radio telescope, a really radio quiet place, you can add baselines to an existing telescope to increase the angular resolution of the telescope. Or you can go out to the middle of nowhere and make a measurement and get your radio data. What can you do with that? And it turns out with even like 50 antennas, which is what we're, we're building systems to handle, you can do incredible things, all right? What kinds of things can we do? Oh, uh, we're, we're covering through, through L-band, basically, when you look at it. Uh, it's getting easy. <laughs> um, you can do geospace radar. You can look to, that, to the near space environment and look at the big events. What happens when, when something big happens? You can look in propagation or in scattering. You can look at the galaxy and make very precise high angular resolution maps of that emission of radio signals from synchrotron radiation from the galaxy. So you can add baselines that bring the resolution of existing maps up a factor of 10. You can also fill in the holes in the maps that are in the southern hemisphere where often we didn't have radio telescopes to make the measurements at certain frequencies. Um, you can look at emissions from the sun or you can look at emissions from Jupiter and you can make point maps and map the precise region around, say, the Jovian magnetosphere where emission is coming from as a spot map instead of as a big blob. Okay, so you can trace the emissions throughout the Jovian magnetosphere. You can also do that near the sun. This is actually doing that with the MWA radio telescope. This is a coronal mass ejection coming off the sun. This is an optical image. These are the radio point location maps of the emissions. So you can do very exciting solar system science. I'm working with UNH to use rapid to image lightning on millisecond time scales. Very high SNR. Uh, you have a lightning burst. You measure the angle and elevation, you know, the azimuth and elevation of the signal as a function of you know, the microsecond <laughs> or the millisecond. And you can map out the lightning discharge. And this was done by uh, Michael Stock from the University of New Mexico for his PhD thesis. Uh, we're headed, instead of doing this with systems that operate at 50 mega samples, 100 mega samples, towards systems that are going to operate at 6 giga samples to do this. And it's a very exciting project. I hope we get that, one, that particular one funded. But we're doing some stuff with the rapid hardware to do that. Um, Hardware-wise, for the hardware walks, we're integrating things down. Uh, we have what I call the E-series or the Edis series, because they're very convenient, nice radios. Thank you very much. Uh, they are, we also have the I-series, which is an analog devices A to D converter integrated with a Zinc Ultrascale Plus FPGA. And all of this then lives in an enclosure that lives under those antenna bases and uh, gets integrated down. And you know, if it gets too hot, it's a science measurement, we turn it off <laughs> and let it cool down. Often we, you know, that's inconvenient from a schedule point of view, but it's not like we're, uh, <clears throat> we're being driven hard. We're integrating all the hardware down. This is the analog hardware. This is the power board for the data acquisition system. And we're, you know, we're in the 40 to 75 watt range. I wanted to be about half this. It's very hard to get the computing that records the data down into low power levels. The radios, we can turn off a lot of the computing and bring the radio power levels way, way down. But the computing is very, very hard to get into those power levels. Uh, there's wireless connectivity in and out of these things. Uh, and it, it, you know, it's actually, you know, the idea is, is you have a system, you can pick it up and you can deploy it and put a radio array out in a week instead of a year, all right? 
Antennas, we have some beautiful astronomy antennas that have been developed, characterized, measured, and had, you know, used for astronomical purposes. We're leveraging the effort that's going into the square kilometer array radio telescope in order to make, you know, our, our ability to adapt these. Uh, this was actually a low frequency telescope. This is a, a, a square kilometer array mid frequency telescope, and this is a higher frequency telescope antenna. And so we can operate with all of these, some of them simultaneously, uh, and there's a lot of details in that. The field unit bases that we're building everything into hold stuff modularly. I, need, I have these done. These, I need to make a, put a real picture in there. We've deployed some prototypes to Peru and elsewhere to try to make measurements. And uh, you know, underneath it all is this is its own shipping container. You can stack it up and bolt it together with the antennas in between and put it on a pallet and send it wherever you want. Uh, and I have my own containers too, which is kind of cool. Um, rapid energy unit, one of the things we ran into that's very difficult is we want very precise measurements with a data and a computer system right under an antenna. And it turns out this is hard. There's a lot of EMI, self-EMI. Uh, the solar battery subsystem we've had to develop took a lot longer than I thought, but we have it working now. And it's how do you charge batteries from solar panels and run a load without the noise from the switching power supplies involved getting out into the antenna. Okay, that's a challenging, challenging problem. And we're very happy. We actually also had to increase the amount of power this could handle uh, significantly. So we can handle up to six batteries and up to 400 watts of solar panel. Um, clocks and synchronization are fundamental to all astronomy and radar measurements. The better your clock, the better the performance you are in terms of self-estimation, joint estimation with multiple receive sites. Uh, those clocks can be incredibly cool. We've got a board we're developing for RAPID that uh, has both an oven-controlled oscillator and a chip-scale atomic clock. And it's got a GPS. It can do a stabilized GPS DO and lock everything. But more importantly, I can let everything drift and measure what happens. <laughs> and I can record it with the voltages and use it in software to correct the data at the voltage level. Okay? So I can close my clock loop to stabilize my radio array in the supercomputer, where I have a lot of computing. Low-cost radars for space weather, other things we're doing. I'm working on thousand-ish element systems for array radar at low cost. Uh, these would be to do the space weather monitoring, the, monitoring the incoherent scatter radar uh, with square kilometer array antennas on the receive side. So they're actually broadband receive. And you can do all kinds of tricks with digital array radar to do this. Uh, and uh, this project's actually going OK, except we need more money for it. Uh, <laughs> everybody needs more money for everything. Uh, we have a very exciting NASA CubeSat mission that's coming up called Aero. This is using a sensor that's a talk in itself. It's called an electromagnetic vector sensor. It allows us to achieve angular resolution from a single antenna in a common phase center and either do direction finding or imaging of sources that are of low complexity. And we're going to fly this over the Earth's aurora and measure signals down at about 1 to 4 megahertz. Okay? These are emissions the Earth makes when the space environment is slammed because of waves and particles that are energized in the polar caps of the Earth's space environment. So we're going to fly through these things and capture this with a CubeSat. This, is, you know, this satellite is going to be about that big. And uh, the antenna technology, I encourage you to read the paper. It's pretty cool. Um, next generation radio astronomy. Uh, this is a slide I put up for a proposal we've actually got out working with the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. And this is the same software radio, radio architecture I developed and worked on in 2001, except the difference is in 2001, I had 100 megabits per second per port into the computers. And now I'm talking about one terabit per second per port into the computers. All right? And so we're looking at how to handle kind of exascale software radio on a single telescope. You can run wide bandwidths, or you can run complex phased array feeds that allow you to extract more information from the single sensor than you were able to otherwise. Uh, this all gets reference to hydrogen masers or even better clocks in the future. Um, and uh, down the road, you know, we're looking at recapitalization of the Millstone Hill site. A very exciting thing to be aware of is simultaneous transmit and receive. This is how do you transmit continuously and receive continuously with the same sensor, but get near to or at the thermal noise floor. Okay, and I, you know I have an ambition to build one of these that's got a lot of elements and replaces our existing systems, because this could be the next Arecibo. Okay, this could be the next rate giant radio telescope, 
and the next giant space surveillance radar all in one. So we're, we're working with at Lincoln Laboratory on some of these technologies and concepts. And you know, maybe 20 years from now, I'll actually have gotten it to happen. This community might want to know about Digital RF. We released this as open source about a year and a half ago. The, uh, what is it, Ryan, which release is it, 2.6? Just was released today. Was it today or yesterday? Today. today. And uh, this is a data recording format for scientific applications. It's great for student projects. It's open source, plays nice with GNU Radio. It has extremely high write rates. It has things like ring buffering and mirroring and snapshotting. Um, it uses underneath it an HDF5 data format, which is a scientific data format. And uh, it's great for persisting your data and metadata. And then when you want to look it up, there's a really clever feature, which is due to Juha Virnanen, who's my colleague. He thought of indexing every sample in the data relative to 1 January 1970. So when we take data on sensors, it is globally indexed, and you ask for the sample you want from the sensor. And it's order one to get the data back and loaded. So you just load the data, boom, now I'm doing my signal processing. Um, it took, I've done about four or five, maybe six data formats, and Yuha had done about three or four. And he wanted simplicity, and I wanted long-term usability and metadata. And we had a great software engineer, Bill Rideout, who worked with us. And then later, Ryan Voltz up in the back, and John Sabota worked on this. And um, you know, we finally actually think that we got scientific data right for radio. And um, we've got some scripts that we can play stuff back to, so you can do transceiver stuff. Um, so my conclusion, go, go create the future. Uh, Abe Lincoln probably did not say this is my guess. <laughs> I have this feeling. But the best way to predict the future is to go think of a great idea and pursue it. And sometimes it may take you a decade if you're students or two decades. Okay? I've been pursuing some of these ideas for 20 years. All right? And they're starting to come true. We can do some things today that are staggering. And I've had a lot of support along the way from the United States government and the US taxpayer, which I'm very grateful for. And you know, for the kids that you've got, Get them involved in radio. We had a Cub Scout group visiting Haystack. We gave them a tour. We had software radios set up for them to play with, and that was the most popular thing at the whole tour. All right, so that's our future. Thank you very much. <laughs>